Good morning, Oaks Church. How we feeling, everybody? How's my second service doing today? You guys excited to be in the house of the Lord? It's great to see you. It's Palm Sunday, kicking off Holy Week. Are you ready to worship with us? Come on, let's go.
Good morning, Oaks Church. Good morning. You guys look lovely. You make me happy, just as happy as I am this day turning beautiful. Don't you love what God does for us? <laughs> happy, happy day. Welcome, 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 online family. We're so happy you're joining us today. It's going to be a great message. Awesome. You guys ready? Ready to worship? You fired up? You got energy? No, don't, don't be coming in here all sleepy, man. You got to come in here fired up and ready, all right? Uh, our team is ready. It's going to be an awesome, awesome service today. I just want to pray, and we're going to jump right into this worship set and just keep going. Father, thank you for this day. We love you. We give you praise and glory and honor. God, we ask you to meet us here. We're here today to meet with you, to connect with you. Father, release your spirit to us and invigorate our souls. In Jesus' name, we give you praise. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. Come on, let's worship.
we'll sing it, church. Let your voices rise today. that today. You are worthy. All the glory, all the honor, all our worship. Jesus, be enthroned today in our worship. Be exalted. day in history they're on a cross they made for sinners for every curse his blood atone one final breath and it was finished but not the end we could For the earth began to shake And the veil was done You glad for that today? What sacrifice was made As the heavens rose Come on, help me sing it if you know
the spirit of the Lord is there's freedom there's hope there's victory there's healing come on doesn't matter what you came into this place carrying we serve a big big God we serve a God that is more than able do you believe that church awesome awesome we're so glad you've joined us today let's pray together let's let's pray and let's uh, just thank God for what we feel in this room God we acknowledge you we thank you for your presence resting on us in this moment of worship God thank you for the name above all names that we can lift up your name high above whatever it is we're facing god we know your name is greater thank you that you're moving on every heart every mind there's no depression no anxiety in your presence there's healing in this house there's victory in this house god prepare us to receive all that you have for us today in the name of jesus if you believe in oaks church can you say a big amen awesome one more time make some noise for jesus god bless you be friendly find a few people say hello and you may be seated church unless you invite them right and yeah, so we have invites here they're at the next step um, desk over there please grab one on your way out and go and invite someone to Easter yes mm -hmm. amen amen like I love Christmas that's a big deal and Jesus came but I tell you what if he didn't die for us we wouldn't be going to heaven that veil wouldn't be torn you can go straight to Jesus you don't yeah. have to hear from someone that says they hear from God but you don't you hear from God right and that's a beautiful thing we love that so for Easter, we're hoping that it's really packed out, right? So what do we need to do, Everly? We need to register, register some seats for Easter. Um, they're, I think you can do it through the app, the online to register some seats. We have plenty of room and we wanna make room for you and plan for you. You don't have to have a ticket to get in or anything, but it just helps us prepare and that you have a seat and a seat for your friends also, so. Yeah, and what do we have, something going on for the kids? We do have something going for our kids' ministry. So some of the leaders will be dressing up as characters from the Bible and going through the life of Jesus. So it's like a come alive through his story. Yep. Yeah, that's, awesome. that's incredible, that's so fun. 
So, and then we also have the Sunday after, we're gonna have one service, it's gonna be at 10 o'clock, it's our Sunday fun day. So this is a chance for people that got to come on Easter, but it's not really like necessarily a normal service, so we want them to see like a normal service and then we're gonna like party hard afterwards. And I mean Jesus way, you know, not like your college times or whatever. So yeah, yeah, there'll be bouncy houses, nine square, so many things, cotton candy for the kids. It's gonna be really fun. Yeah, we're gonna sugar them up for y'all so they have an awesome nap after that. <laughs> well, another announcement we have is tomorrow night we have our ladies get together Monday night um, Bible study, and I'll be speaking. So I would love to see you guys there at six thirty. Yeah, that's gonna be really fun. So, um, and eventually we'll get bigger and bigger. And I'm like, can we start doing potlucks? Because I wanna eat like every time we're together. Like, I don't want a bag of chips. I want like food, you know, like food, food. So yeah, yeah it's gonna be fun. All right, well now I would like to welcome my incredible, amazing husband, Pastor Joel. He's got a great word for you guys today. All right. That was better, babe, that was better. Last time she didn't, the announcement wasn't good. It wasn't good. She, I, I expected her, it's her first time to, you know, announce me coming to the stage. I was thinking it was gonna be like UFC style, like, and now, in the blue corner. Yeah, I just really, you know, had kind of worked it up in my mind and didn't go as I thought and I got a little offended, but just kidding. Are we good? Are you happy? Are you glad you're at Oaks Church? Thank you for being with us today. Uh, if we haven't met, my name's Joel. Would love to meet you as well in the lobby. Jennifer and I are just so honored and grateful to have uh, the chance to pastor this church. We feel like we won the lottery. God picked us to be with such wonderful people like you. And uh, thank you for trusting and thank you for partnering and being uh, with us. Great things going on at Oaks Church. I wanna especially thank those of you that are making babies. We got some brand new babies in the room. Thank you for making those babies grow in the church the way God intended, uh, you know, just keep growing that church. Some of y'all need to make more babies. We got we to gotta populate, amen, populate, take territory, get out there, get busy, get busy, amen. Uh, let me pray. We're going to jump right into our message today. Father, in the name of Jesus, we love you so much. We're grateful for this opportunity to be with you in your house. God, you are so good to us, and we are here to worship you. We're here to meet with you. Father, we're here to hear your voice. Would you speak to us today? Anoint the words that come out of my mouth, Father, and help people to be enlightened and for the light bulbs to come on in their minds. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. Man, well, we are uh, coming into Easter next week. I'm so pumped and excited uh, for that. As Jennifer mentioned, it's it's our Super Bowl. It's the biggest day of the year uh, for people that believe in Jesus. We're the only faith-based belief system on the planet whose God is actually alive, right? I mean, Jesus, he came, he lived, he, 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 he died for our sins, and he came back to life, and he's still alive. This isn't a myth. It's not a legend. It's a historical fact. Over 500 people saw him alive after he was in the grave for three days and three nights. It's not a fluke. It's the real deal. And guess what? Jennifer and I have been to Israel. We've seen the garden tomb. It's empty, y'all. Heroes. And so we're excited uh, for this uh, season. We need to be uh, just, just exuberant. I'm inviting every single person. I'm hoping uh, everyone I talk to, I'm like, you got a church? You got a church? Is your church any good? If it's not, come to our, I'm just playing. No, but uh, we, we, wanna, we want specifically people that don't have a home church or, or they're not really planted uh, in, in, in a place. We want to help them find a place. And that's what Oaks Church is all about is helping people get planted in the house of God. The Bible says, if you're planted in the house of the Lord, you'll flourish in the courts of your God. And we wanna help people grow big, strong, powerful. Oaks Church, our whole vision comes from Isaiah 61, uh, the, the, the mission and the ministry of the Messiah. And he speaks of his people. He calls them oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for God's splendor and glory. And that's us, that's you. God's got big things to do uh, with the people at Oaks Church. So thank you for being here. Hey, uh, I'm gonna start with a question today. Uh, the question is simply this, have you ever been offended? And you're like, what time is it, <laughs> right? Because, I mean, it's easy to get offended nowadays, right? We get offended in traffic. 
We get offended at the Starbucks. Uh, we get offended at bumper stickers. We get offended at people's uh, political views. We get offended at d decisions that are made inside of government or at work or whatever. There are things that happen that take us off. Does anybody have just something? Don't, don't, you don't have to like tell us what it is, but something that just can get your blood boiling. I mean, just real quick, right? Certain things, certain topics can just be a trigger for us. We've got stuff we've been through. We've got things uh, that we've walked through in our past, and we can get worked up pretty quick. And I got a couple of those things. Uh, I don't like to be patronized or talked down to. Can I tell you, I have one problem that I'm really kind of still embarrassed about uh, that I'm working through. I don't like it if someone touches my hair. Uh, Jennifer was my hairstylist, and, and, and I, I thought that if I married my hairstylist that it would save me a lot of money. <laughs> did not. It did not. It, I, I, it did not. But, but she's been a wonderful hairstylist, but I, I would allow her to touch my hair, one person, for over 30 years until I decided to get a fade, and she didn't know how to do it. So, so now I have, to, I have to go to somebody, but they're good. I mean, they're really good, so it's okay. But, but I'm serious. Uh, because of things that happened in my childhood when I was a kid, when I was little, I was taken advantage of, and I was always small, and I had this little chihuahua chip on my shoulder, like, no one's going to mess with me, I'm going to fight, and I'm going to defend myself, and when somebody bigger than me would do this, like, little thing and rub on my head or, or whatever, it would make me mad, it would make me angry, and, and, and I, I didn't realize how much of a problem it was until I almost got in a fight somewhere because somebody touched my hair in public, and, and listen, don't, I'm just saying don't do it. Like, don't do it in the lobby today and think it's funny. I'll jack you in the mouth. I won't feel bad at all. I won't even have to pray about it. I won't have to say, I'm sorry to God. I'm like, I warned him, Jesus. I warned him, right? But, but I, I literally, I didn't realize how bad it was until my daughter was about four and I'm playing around with her or whatever, and she did this to me, and I was getting ready to go somewhere, and, and so I'd, I'd fixed my hair and whatever, and listen, this doesn't just happen, y'all. This is work, okay? This is work. And, and, and she did this, and I slapped my four-year-old baby girl's hand away. I'm like, don't touch my hair. And I instantly realized I was a psychopath. And I need psychiatric help. I need to speak to someone. I need to see a counselor for this. And, and I just want to give you a praise report. I've been in counseling for a while now. And last week, a little kid in service jumped up and touched my hair. And I didn't kill him I, in the lobby right there. I, I didn't kill him. I, I thought about it. I had that little twinge. I reached for my sidearm. I, don't, I, didn't, I didn't have one on then. But sometimes I might. You don't, you don't, you don't know. That's why I wear my shirt a little long right here. You don't know what I got. You don't know what I got. You come in here acting crazy, you might find out. That's all I'm telling you. But uh, no, but, but I, I, I've been offended at times. I, I remember a time I got offended in church. You ever been offended in church? What time is it? You might be today, right? I, I mean, I got offended one time, and I had been um, kind of semi-pseudo-promoted and I was the youth pastor at a, at a really large church, and there were hundreds of kids. I mean, we'd, we would run six, 700 kids a week in the youth group. And then I moved into a new season where I uh, was doing the college ministry, too. And when you're a youth pastor that now gets to do college ministry, it's the coolest thing. Uh, really, really, really cool, because all of a sudden you realize that you, have, uh, you don't have to deal with... You, they're kind of adults, right? They're still young and fun and hip and whatever, but, but they're... You, you don't have to deal with parents. You don't have to deal with puberty. You don't have to deal. It's a little different. And I was really enjoying it. I was having a great time. And all of a sudden, I, I realized uh, that there was a, a new guy that they were looking to hire. And my boss was telling me, no, don't worry about him. Don't worry about him. He's for older singles. He's for older. It's not for you. This is whatever. You're, you're the guy for this. And, and I didn't. I was doing double duty. I was running two different departments. I wasn't getting paid anymore. So I was doing it just for the love of it. And, and I was really loving it. I mean, it was my favorite part of my job was working with the college students. And then they hire this dude and they bring him in and we're in service that day. And, and all of a sudden they make an announcement in the service in front of thousands of people that this guy was going to not just be over older singles, but over all of them, college students too. And I got demoted publicly. Like I found out, you ever, you ever found out bad news like in front of people and you got to put a face on? Right, I got demoted publicly, and it, it wasn't trying to do it. It just was in the moment and whatever, and, and, and then it got, and then, and then the bad part happened. He began to try to say something good about me and, and, and how hard I'd been working and whatever, but he used this old like story or fable or whatever, and he said, Joel has been running around crazy like the little Dutch boy 
trying to put his thumb in the dike to hold back the, and, and I, I mean, I was instantly, what, I, what did you call me, little Dutch boy? Did you just call me? I'm not a boy crying out. I'm a grown man. You call me a Dutch boy, little Dutch. I don't know what a Dutch boy even is. I know what a Dutch oven is. Uh, but, and, and my thumb did what? What are you saying? And I was just, I was, oh, I couldn't hear anything else. My blood pressure rose. I got all hot. And, 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 and I'm sitting there trying to smile in front of half thousands of people. But I was, I was offended. You ever been offended? <sighs> Happens, right? Listen, our culture, our world is so easily offended. Joel, how does this have anything to do with Easter? When you look at the story of Easter, Jesus riding in on the donkey, did you know Jesus could be offensive sometimes? Did you know that? You read the Bible? Jesus said stuff, Jesus said stuff to people he liked that was harsh, that was rough. He, he, he said to Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. Whoa, that's offensive. He would say to his disciples all the time, he would say things like, uh, he, he would say things like, how long must I be with you, oh ye people of little faith? He would get frustrated. And the story, we get into the story of, of Easter in this Easter season, the last days of Jesus' life. Jesus did things that, that tick people off. J Jesus literally, first of all, he rides in on a donkey. He, he had just raised Lazarus from the dead. Everybody uh, was in awe, and people are getting saved left and right, but the religious people were mad. They didn't like that at all. And, and so he'd raised him from the dead, but, but, but all of a sudden, he's riding in on the donkey, and the donkey he's riding in on was, was a it was a young donkey, and when a king rode in on a donkey, it was a symbol of peace. He was the king of peace. And, and when he comes back, consequently, he won't be on a donkey. The Bible says he'll be on a white stallion with a sword coming out of his mouth, and he'll have uh, tattoos down his thighs that say, Lord of Lords and King of Kings, and our, our, our names will be inscribed, cut into his hands. I mean, Jesus, when he's coming back, he's coming back as a king for war, to defeat the enemy once and for all. It's a really, really big deal. But on this specific day, he's literally riding in on the donkey, and they begin to cry out and shout out and say something about him. They said, Hosanna, Hosanna to the son of David. That word Hosanna means, Lord, save us now. They were calling him the Messiah, and the religious people got so offended. They said, Jesus, tell them to stop. Do you hear what they're saying? And he said, if I tell them to stop, the rocks will cry out. But that wasn't even the worst of it. Oh, this was a, this was a wild week. Jesus, Jesus was like, do uh, you remember the movie Braveheart, one of my favorite all-time movies? There's a scene in Braveheart where, where William Wallace rides out on the horse, and he's being aggressive, and they're like, what are you doing? And he says in his thick Scottish accent, he says, I came to pick a fight. <laughs> Listen, there were times where Jesus came to pick a fight. And he shows up after he rides into town. He goes back out, and he had seen some things that ticked him off. And he goes home, and he makes a whip. He fashions, and he makes a whip. And on his way back into town, he sees a fig tree that doesn't have any fruit on it. And he's mad because he wants breakfast. But the problem is it's not the season for figs. It's not fig season. But he doesn't care. He's the king of kings, the lord of lords. He wants figs. So he's mad. He's irritated. And he says, never bear fruit again. And the tree literally withers and dies in the next 24 hours. But he goes into town. He goes into the temple. He takes his whip. He starts cracking this whip, turning over the tables and chairs and money tables inside of the temple where the religious elite people had a mafia-style system set up where they would tell you, no, no, your sacrificial offering isn't good enough. You're, it's not clean. We have a clean one here. Here, give us yours, and we'll sell you this one. And it was a money-making scheme inside of God's house to fleece and take from the people. Then they would take the offering that they just took from someone else, saying, no, no, it's not good enough. Take it behind the curtain, sell the same offering to someone else. It was a scam. And Jesus was ticked about it. Well, I just changed my language right there. And, and Jesus, aren't you proud of me? I'm so mature all of a sudden. And, and Jesus, he was ticked. 
And he comes and he's turning the tables over. And he's cracking the whip and he runs them all out. Guys, it was an actual real insurrection. A real one. Not a fake one, a real one. He took over the government. He actually set up shop. He ran them all out. He ran his ministry out of the temple for the rest of the week, and they couldn't do anything about it. He literally took over the government as the king of kings, as the lord of lords, as the king of peace that came in on the donkey, but he wasn't a sissy. Why do we imagine Jesus as this sad little sissy? Jesus was a manly man. He was a masculine man. People were afraid of him. Not the kids, because the little kids could see the, the love in his heart and in his eyes. But people were afraid because he was so powerful, and he wasn't afraid to speak the truth because he is the truth. And sometimes the truth hurts, right? The truth hurts. My wife tells me the truth. Sometimes I don't like it. Sometimes I don't like how she says it but I'm glad she tells me the truth. I'm glad that I have a wife that will be a good reflection for me. Listen, I want real friends that will tell me if I have lettuce in my teeth. I want you to tell me if I step on toilet paper and it's on my heel. I want you to tell me if I didn't zip up. I want you to be a friend to me. Don't let me walk around looking like an idiot, right? Tell me the truth. I want my wife, when I put on my outfit, I'm like, what you say, girl? Right? <laughs> but sometimes she's like, oh no, don't ever wear that again. In fact, where did you get those shoes? They're atrocious. I'm like, you bought me these shoes last season. I've worn them twice. They're hideous. Get rid of them. Right? She tells me the truth and she makes sure that I look okay. Thank you, baby, for helping me with that. I, I need some help sometimes, right? I did pick this out. Although I, did, I did this all by myself, so I'm learning, okay? I'm learning. So, no, but, but, but Jesus, literally, he goes in. He doesn't just stop with messing with their money, with turning everything over. He literally sets up shop, and it says that he allows everyone to come into the temple. The sick people, the unclean people, the elitist religious people, they had made themselves a giant platform and a giant place for their own wealth-making industry, and they kept everyone else out they were excluding and Jesus included and brought everyone in and they wanted to kill him for it they were offended at him Jesus would say things to offend people on purpose sometimes Jesus said to those religious people he called them whitewashed tombs full of dead men's bones called them filthy cups or vessels that were full of filth on the inside but washed and polished on the outside. Broods of vipers, he called them. Jesus would say some stuff sometimes. He wasn't afraid to be strong in his language. He wasn't afraid to speak the truth. This Easter season has a lot of opportunity for offense there are people, we're going to have lots of fun with the kids. We're probably going to have some gifts and some different things. They may get an Easter egg. There may be a bunny. I don't know. People get so upset. This is supposed to be about Jesus. Why would you have pagan worship at the church? Jesus made bunnies. He made chickies too. Guess what else he made? The rainbow. Y'all can't have it. It's God's. We got to quit letting people steal what God made. It's his. It's for his glory, right? And we can have fun in church. Anybody grow up in a church that was no fun? We don't want to have a church like that. People learn better when they're laughing. They learn better when they're in a good mood. Guess what? Workers work better when they're happy, when they're in a good mood. It's important that we learn how to create atmospheres of fun and happy and enjoyment because we simply do better in life when we're in those seasons. I want to take you to a couple stories here. In, in the week before uh, resurrection, before the death of Jesus and the resurrection, it was Passover week. Jesus was the Passover Lamb of God that came to take away the sins of the world. And in that week, the same way that they were preparing the lambs for the slaughter 
um, so that the people of God could walk through their Passover ritual. They call it a Passover Seder or ceremony. And they would take a spotless lamb and they would slaughter and prepare and they would roast that lamb. And part of it would be given as an offering for their sins. The other part would be a, a meal that their family would eat together. And it's a beautiful ceremony. They would drink lots of wine. They would eat wonderful food. They would spend time as a family. It was a big family celebration. And and Jesus was being prepared as the Passover lamb for the sins of the entire world. This is good news. Past sins, present sins, and future sins. Did you know that Jesus already paid the price for the sins you hadn't even thought up yet? Man, that's some good news. Because some of y'all are creative. <laughs> right? Get creative with that sinning, right? Just, just get good at it, man. You practiced for a long time. You're good at it. He died for the stuff you haven't even thought up yet. Already paid the price. So that when you find yourself in that situation, you blow it. Guess what? Your forgiveness is already prepared. Your payment has already been paid. All you have to do is repent. Now, I'm not saying these things to give you a license to go be an idiot. Please don't be an idiot. I'm saying that there's no sin that you could sin that's so big that Jesus couldn't solve the problem. His blood was once and for all. And as the Passover lamb, he was being prepared to be a sacrifice. He, he comes back in after raising Lazarus from the dead. He comes back in to Bethany, and he's at a meal in his honor. He was part of a, there's no other way to say it. He was part of a terroristic uh, group of freedom fighters that carried daggers and they would go in and they would cause violent situations against the Romans uh, to create an uproar, to create uh, danger or, or chaos or whatever to try to overthrow the, uh, the Roman Empire. And so Judas, imagine Jesus picked an assassin, someone that was a part of a radical uh, Israeli group to overthrow the nation or the empire of Rome and set them free. That's one of the people that he picked. And he took that person and put him over the money. Do you think Jesus didn't know Judas was stealing from him? 
He knew. And he trusted him anyway. He put him in that position anyway to give him a chance. I believe Jesus wanted to see Judas make the right choice. I believe Jesus wanted to see Judas turn the corner. Some scholars believe that Judas wasn't actually trying to get Jesus killed. Judas was trying to force Jesus' hand to actually be who he said he was and set the nation of Israel free because all of the people were hung up looking for a savior, not for eternity, not for their sins. They were looking for a savior from the tyranny of Rome. They were thinking too small. They were thinking only for their tiny nation. Jesus came to be the savior for the entire cosmos, right? It was a way bigger play. And they were thinking too small. So Judas has second thoughts, tries to take the money back. They won't take it. He throws it into the temple. And the priests there say, that's blood money. We can't put it back in the temple treasury. And they bought a field. It's the same field that later after Jesus was crucified, Judas went out and hung himself and committed suicide. And his body exploded in this field called the potter's field. It then became known as the field of blood because that's the field that those religious people bought with the same 30 pieces of silver. They bought the field where Judas had committed suicide. And when we were in Israel just a few years ago, they said, see that piece of land right over there on the hill? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the potter's field. That's the field of blood. Really? Yeah. That's the one that was bought with Judas's 30 pieces of silver. Do you know what it is today? No, what? It's a burial ground for poor people that can't afford a funeral. When Jesus said, the poor you'll always have with you, he was speaking prophetically of the future that Judas would have and where Judas would be buried, where Jesus would find his end. Pretty amazing. Four days later, Jesus is anointed again. Two times in one week. Jesus is anointed with oil. This is a completely different story at somebody else's house, still in Bethany. Bethany was uh, the favorite spot. Bethany, uh, when you're in Jerusalem, you walk up over the, the Mount of Olives through the Garden of Gethsemane, come down the other side, and Bethany's just on the other side of the, of the hill. It's just a two-mile walk. Uh, it's actually a beautiful, beautiful place. Uh, when he, uh, Jesus was in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper. This is two days before pa Passover now. So he's at Simon's house, not Lazarus' house. He's there two days before Passover, not six days. Uh, a woman who's not named came to him having an alabaster flask of very costly fragrant oil, and she poured it this time on his head as he sat at the table. This is a completely different experience. But when his disciples saw it, plural, they were indignant, saying, why this waste? For this fragrance, uh, fragrant oil might have been sold for much money and given to the poor. And when Jesus was aware of it, he said to them, why do you trouble this woman? She has done a good work for me. The poor you'll always have with you, but me you do not always have. For in pouring out this fragrant oil on my body, she did it for my burial. Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached, in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. And guess what? The prophecy Jesus made is fulfilled in this moment in McKinney, Texas, because we're talking about that woman's offering today. My point in reading those two stories that happened in the same week that were very similar but had their own differences is simply this. It started with Judas's offense, but it didn't stay Judas's offense because offenses are contagious. See, the second story, four days later, now a bunch of the disciples are offended. Because people that are offended typically talk. People that are offended are oftentimes toxic. You ever met someone toxic? I have. You ever been in a toxic season yourself? I have. I've been hurt. I've been betrayed. I've been wounded. I've been angry. I've been bitter. I don't want to stay in those seasons, but guess what? It happens, right? I mean, Jesus said, be sure of this, offenses will come. There are going to be opportunities in your life to get offended. There are going to be opportunities in this church to get offended. Offenses are contagious. They spread. We look at our world, and our world is full. Our, our nation is full of groups of people that huddle together around offense. 
I'm offended about this. I'm offended about that. I'm a part of this party. I'm a part of that party. I hate this guy. I hate that guy. And, and, and they, they, they group up and they share and they spread their offenses. And, and, and we fall into a trap. We fall into a trap where we, we oftentimes get onto social media and we share our offenses with people. And then we rally around, yes, agree, ah, and someone else says it, oh, we don't like you, and ah, all this, whatever. I heard a pastor say one time, it was really interesting, he said, you know what, I, I don't have to have an opinion about everything. You don't have to have an opinion on everything. It's okay. Listen, we get so wrapped up and offended over a lot of times things that have very little eternal value. Now, don't get me wrong, it's important to stand up for what's right. There are, there are issues. There are matters. And in fact, listen, if it wasn't for pastors hundreds of years ago in America speaking up and saying political things about some of the atrocious things that were going on in our nation, if it wasn't for pastors standing up and speaking the truth, we would still speak with an English accent. You know what else might, might still be around? Slavery. Because it was Christian pastors that said, this is not right. And we, we have a whole lot of issues right now that go on in America. And we, we have a lot of mess, guys. We have a lot of mess. But we've also come a long way as a young nation. And the churches of Jesus Christ must stand up and be loud and vocal about things that are against the kingdom of God and the word of God. It's not about being political. It's about being kingdom. It's about being salt and light. Salt and light. And Jesus said this, true religion is to take care of widows and orphans and to keep yourself blameless from the, from the filth of the world. So we, we need to be people that are holy and we need to be people that are healthy and we need to be people that, according to Jesus, are taking care of people and looking out for people that can't take care of themselves. We need to help people, love people, care about people, connect people. I, I was reading a story this week uh, about a family. It's, a, it's a, a man whose name was Blackie Wetzel. He was a Native American man. He was an activist for Native Americans. He was uh, very involved in his tribe, one of the leaders of, on the council in his tribe, the Blackfeet uh, tribe. And he was also very involved in politics in D.C. He worked to specifically create advantages uh, for Native American people and all of that type of thing. And there was a football team that came to Washington, D.C. that Blackie had the opportunity to speak into. And the team was formally called the Braves. But Blackie put together a proposal and he took imagery from the most famous chief inside of the Blackfeet tribe. Uh, his name was Two Guns White Calf, their most famous iconic pre, uh, chief. And he put the ideas together to create a logo and a name. And the name was connected not to the color of the skin, but the color of the war paint that they would wear because of how proud they were of their warriors and specifically this chief. And the name was adopted and the logo was adopted for a, a team called the Washington Redskins. And it was something that Blackie and his tribe were very proud of because it brought honor to their tribe and honor to the Native American people. They were proud to have a team that would represent them and that, that people would rally around their heritage and rally around one of their iconic chiefs and rally around something that, that they, weren't, they, they didn't mind being called a redskin because it was about their power and their, their warfare uh, strategy. It was something they were proud of. And we just watched a couple years ago. Now that is not uh, that's no longer allowed to use that name for that team. And it's not the same logo anymore. And guess what? Blackie's family is so proud of that logo and so proud of that name, they're trying to work with the formerly known as Redskins. What are they, commanders now? We don't even know what they're called anymore. I don't even know what their uniforms look like and nobody cares. But it's, everything's offensive to everyone sometimes, Right? And Blackie's family is like, no, we love that logo. We want that. We're still doing all the same nonprofit work. Can we have the logo back then? Because we're proud of it. We love it. Stuff happens in our world that's weird. You know what I'm offended about? I'm offended about all the stuff that when you were in the 80s, you could say that you can't say anymore. 
crying out loud, they're messing up our language, messing up everything. Can't say anything anymore. I, I offended someone a little while back. I didn't mean to. I was sick. I didn't feel good. I was in the CVS just trying to get some medicine, and, and I'm at the counter, and I'm shuffling through stuff and trying to do some whatever, and, and, and there was a, a very large human standing in front of me, the six foot four, big, I'm talking a couple of 250 pounds or more, very big person with a very, very, very deep voice, and, and I wasn't looking, and I was just whatever, and I heard the person talk, and I said, thank you, sir. And this person was instantly enraged and offended, so much so that they threw my bag at me and wouldn't even look at me or acknowledge me. I hadn't paid attention that this giant person with a big, deep voice and facial hair was wearing a dress. I didn't notice. Didn't notice the fingernail paint. I didn't notice. I was sick. I didn't feel good. And honestly, if I could be really, really real with you, it hurt my heart that I hurt this person. I didn't mean to. But people can't be so easily offended. It's confusing. I, one of the companies I work in, I got called into HR. Because I, I, I said, how's it going, girl? And that person is a they-them person. I didn't know. How am I supposed to know? So I'm talking to the HR person, and I'm like, well, help me out with this. I mean, this person, because I'm in the meeting, and I listen to this person, and, and when this person talks about themselves, they say, I and me. I have to use plural language, but they can use singular language about themselves? I don't understand that. How can you get offended at me for not knowing and saying, not saying they, them, when you say I, me? You should say we, us. Let me know when you're serious about your own plurality. <laughs> right? That's not fair. I'm 50. I can't remember how. I don't know where my keys are. I'm supposed to remember everybody, how they identify. It's hard. It's too much. People get offended so easily. Guys, we can't be that soft-skinned. We got to get thicker-skinned. Because offense is a choice. I, I, um, I cut my teeth in ministry in Carrollton Farmers Branch, uh, working in a youth ministry there. I mentioned earlier hundreds of kids. And, and, and Carrollton Farmers Branch is a really interesting city. Um, I didn't notice. I never paid attention. I just loved everybody. I just love whoever's in front of me. I just love them. And I remember uh, we had some marketing people came in and they're asking me questions and, and they're like, hey, Joel, did you know that you're a white youth pastor of a black youth group? I said, no, I'm not. They said, yes, you are. I said, that's ridiculous. I said, there's tons of, there's everybody here. Everyone, they're all different colors. Everyone's here. They said, no, count. And I turned around and looked at my crowd. There was about 150 kids in that one service on that Sunday morning, another 150 kids the next service. Between two services, I had nine white kids. My whole youth group was black Hispanic. I didn't even know it. Because I, I just love people, right? I'm not, I'm not sitting there, like, keeping tabs on, you know, what rations or ratios or what. I'm not, I mean, I'm just loving people. And I'm like, oh, okay, well, I mean, I'm not going to change how I do anything. I learned a lot, man. I learned a lot. When you grow up as a white kid in a, in, a, in, a, in a hillbilly redneck town in Oklahoma, I didn't know what making waves were. I was sitting next to this kid on the bus, and, he had, and he's just brushing his hair. He had, to me, it was a shoe brush. I'm like, bro, what are you doing with that shoe brush? You've been brushing your hair for four hours. He's like, I'm making waves. I'm like, no, you're not. It's the same for four hours. I'm like, that's a shoe brush, man. That's what you shine your shoes with. He goes, no, man, I'm, I'm making waves. I learned a lot. So many things I didn't know, right? It's, it's cultural. It's fun for me. I love that. Well, well I, I took these kids from North Dallas, from Carrollton Farmers Branch, on a camping trip, a beach camp, to Panama City Beach, Florida. Now, if you've never been there, you, you would think it's beautiful. It's right on the ocean. It's just about an hour or so out from Destin. It's gorgeous. But they call it the Redneck Riviera. And there's... Confederate flags everywhere, and there, I mean, the Dukes of Hazard maybe was a very, very a favorite show there or something. I don't know, the General Lee probably goes up and down the strip all the time. And, and I'm hanging out, and I've got 200 kids at a summer camp in the Redneck Riviera, and I'm the white youth pastor of a black youth group and didn't know it. And we rented 
uh, condos in a resort retirement community. And I've literally got 140 African-American kids invading this retirement community in the Redneck Riviera. And it didn't take maybe a day and a half for somebody to say, hey, boy, get off my lawn. And when I heard about that, I was looking for the address. And I'm going to have a talk with this gentleman, whoever he may be, and we're going to talk about what goes on because that's not going to happen. And before I could get to it, my kids had gone into town, made T-shirts at some little place. They could do sp whatever, air-sprayed T-shirts, all kinds of colored whatever and characters on them. And they made characters kind of like Fat Albert. Remember the show Fat Albert? Can't do that anymore. Dude, Bill Cosby had a show, Fat Albert. First of all, you're calling the guy, he's the nicest guy in the world. You're calling him Fat Albert? What's up with that, man? And then you got the other guy's name, Big Lip. And then the other guy, you can't even talk. He's like, ba -dee, ba -dee, ba -dee, ba -dee, ba -dee. I mean, it's like you're literally making fun of all of these people, speech impediments and overweight and all this kind of whatever. They made shirts like that. And on the back of their shirts, it said, I'm proud my daddy's black. I'm proud my mama's black. And a whole bunch of kids are walking around this redneck Riviera retirement home choosing to be proud of themselves and not allow some idiot to steal their fun. And I was super proud of them because they didn't walk around offended. They didn't walk around with a chip on their shoulder. They said, this dude's an idiot. Guess what? We're proud of who we are. And, and we'll, be, we'll, we'll, we'll have even more fun. Kind of like David when he was dancing before the Lord and his small-minded wife said, you're acting like a fool, degrading yourself publicly. And David turns around to her and says, I'll be even more foolish than this. Offense is a choice. Can I tell you what else? Offense is a trap. That word in scripture, offense, it's from the word scandalon or scandalizo. It literally means a scandal. If you are caught in a scandal, that's a bad thing. It's not about a scandal happening to you. It's about you being the person in the scandal. It, it's, it's translated into a snare or a trap or to be enticed in. I want to show you a couple of Scandals, a couple of traps. The first one's kind of cute. It's a little, little bitty rope snare uh, you would use for hunting. And you're wanting some of you've seen this probably in a cartoon or somewhere. And they step in it. It sucks. It, you know, it it's trigger, has a trigger and it pulls them up in the air. Or maybe it's a little bunny rabbit runs through and snares them and you catch them. It's a hunting thing. And then the next one is a little bit more severe. This is where you, you crush the little brains, right? I mean, that one's, that, that snare's a little different, a little more intense. Snares aren't always cute. This one's a brain crusher. And let's look at the next one. Oh, yeah, the old bear trap. Not so cute anymore. You get stuck in this one, you're going to bleed out and die, right? What about the next one? This is a pit trap. This is a scandal that will cost you your life. And when the enemy sets traps in your life, he sets pitfalls in your life. He sets booby traps all through the areas of your life, in your ministry, in your place where you volunteer, at your work, in your church, in your marriage with your kids. You ever been offended at your kids? I have, crying out loud. I work my butt off for those kids. Sometimes they're like, eh. I'm like, what the heck, man? I'm over here sweating, paying money, doing this and that and whatever, and all I get is a meh. Crying out loud. It's, tra it's challenging sometimes. We can get offended. There are traps everywhere. But the trap isn't about them. The trap is about you. And the devil wants you stuck in a trap. He wants you stuck in a fence. Because if he can get you to stay in a fence, he can have you dying in a pit somewhere. It's not cute, it's not a little pet. It's something that will absolutely ruin your life. You can get offended in church. I've been offended in church so many times. Guys, I almost left church. It's bad when the preacher wants to leave. <laughs> right? When the preacher's like, man, forget this place, I'm out. I mean, that's a bad day. But I've been there. I've been in times in ministry where I, I'm like, you know what, I'm done with this. I, I could make more money elsewhere. I'll go do something else where people actually like me. 
You know, not here. This is amazing. This is wonderful. I'm grateful for y'all. I'm talking about there. <laughs> right? But, but, but it's, it's easy to get into a place where you're overlooked or you're betrayed or you're hurt or someone says something or does something or whatever. And, and we, can, we can step into that trap. And if we're not careful, we'll stay there. And we'll make other people sick all around us. John the Baptist had an opportunity to get offended. John John the Baptist was Jesus' cousin. He was the one that set Jesus up for ministry. He was the one that said, that's the Lamb of God who's come to take away the sins of the world. John the Baptist was the one that said, I must decrease, he must increase. He said, that guy, I'm not even worthy to tie his sandals. He elevated him. He positioned him. He declared to everyone, that's the Messiah. But then John the Baptist, because he wasn't afraid to speak the truth to power, found himself in prison because he told King Herod that King Herod was a sinful man and that he needed to repent. King Herod didn't want to hear that, didn't like that. Uh, The reason that John the Baptist told him that he needed to repent is because King Herod had killed his own brother and stolen his wife. And and so John's on death row. And John's looking at the scriptures, and he's hearing all the stories of Jesus out there doing all kinds of miracles, doing all the things that the Messiah is supposed to do. Because Isaiah 61, that we uh, built our entire church vision out of, is is the same passage that John is looking at going, this doesn't add up. Because Isaiah 61 says you'll preach the gospel to the poor, you'll, make, you'll heal up the, the brokenhearted, you'll um, set the captive free and release those from prison and darkness. Where are you at, Mr. Messiah? I, I mean, you, I hear you're doing great stuff, but I'm your cousin and I'm on death row. Can I get a little hookup? And, and the disciple, he literally sends his disciples to Jesus, asking Jesus are you really the Messiah or not? Because if you're the Messiah, how about you do what it said in Isaiah 61 and release me, your cousin, from captivity? Are you Messiah or not? Listen, you can find yourself in a place in life where you're looking at God and you're offended. Because God didn't do what you wanted him to do. I get to go to a funeral this week. One of my... One of my Good friend's sons, 26 years old, died of a fentanyl overdose. Got addicted three years ago. He's overdosed a whole bunch of times. And I get to be in that funeral this week, remembering a beautiful young man that just got, he just got sucked into a trap. The family prayed, they believed. And listen, they're in a wonderful place. They're, they're doing very well with the circumstances, and they're loving God. But guys, I'm telling you, we've been through stuff where God, and you're wanting God to show up, you're expecting him to show up, and then he doesn't do what you think he should do. That's where John was. He was in a faith crisis. And there was a huge opportunity for offense, for a scandal. Luke chapter 17, one. Then he said to the disciples, oh, pardon me, that's, that's the wrong one, oops. This is Matthew chapter 11, verse three. The disciples came to him and said, are you the coming one, the Messiah, or do we look for another? Jesus answered and said to them, go and tell John the things which you hear and see. And he he literally quotes Isaiah 61. He says, the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. He lists off all the different things that the Messiah would do. The only thing he leaves out is the very one thing that John is asking him to do, release the captives from prison. And then Jesus, instead of saying, release the captives from prison, he says this, and blessed is he who is not offended because of me. He was saying, John, I'm sorry, man, I'm not coming. You're the last Old Testament prophet. And all of the Old Testament prophets were killed or martyred, persecuted. You're the last one. Not coming for you. You have a reward that's greater. Uh, Speaking of those prophets, and when you look at the hall of fame of faith, as they call it, Hebrews chapter 11, it, it talks about all these incredible prophets and heroes and warriors and amazing things. And it talks about all the people that died in their faith. It says that all those heroes, all those heroes, it says none of them saw the fulfillment of the promise. We, we get to see the fulfillment of the promise, Jesus. None of them, they all died 
without ever seeing or receiving it. And it says that the world is not worthy of them. God is calling us to a level of personal faith. He's calling us into a season of of incredible faith to believe in him in the midst of offenses. To not try, I've said some things today that could be potentially offensive. I, I talked about some edgy things. I did it on purpose. I wanted to give you a chance to pass the test because offense is a choice. Offense is a choice. And as the people of God, We've got to rise above all the baloney that the rest of our nation, the rest of the world gets all offended about, gets their feelings hurt about, gets all in a tizzy. We've got to rise above that. We've got to figure out how to love people and how to not have such short triggers. That there, there are things in my life that I'm still working on because I have, I have a couple short fuses, a couple areas where I can get ticked pretty quick and I don't want to stay that way. I want to work on that. I want to get better at that. Because I can't live my life in a place of offense and, and I can't live my life that vulnerable where, where if someone treats me with dishonor, that I let that ruin my day or ruin a week or ruin a whatever, ruin an opportunity because they didn't treat me the way I think I should have been treated, didn't speak to me the way I think I should have been treated. Why would I give some rando human that much power over my peace, over my soul? over my heart. It's a challenge for all of us, isn't it? I want to pray for you today. I don't know where you find yourself today. It's possible there's a, hundreds of people in the room. It's possible that, that all of you have come to know Jesus. It's possible that there's some people in the room, and certainly with hundreds and hundreds more watching online, that there are people that are listening or watching a podcast or, or whatever, and, and, and you don't know Jesus. He's not the Lord of your life. You've never made him Lord. You may believe in him. You may think fondly of him, but you've never actually made him your Lord. Or maybe you did in the past, but you haven't been living for him. You haven't let him be the, the, the boss or the master of your life. You've got areas of your life where you're in charge. You're the master. You live for you. Today's your day. This is your moment to make Jesus the Lord of your life. Would you pray with me right here in this moment? Just just allow just a quick inventory in your own heart. Is he the Lord of your life? Have you made him the Lord? Do you actually obey him? Maybe you've been in a place of being stuck in a fence, angry at this, angry at that, triggered by this, triggered by that. And you want to make Jesus, the Lord of that area of your life. He's the master. He's the master. There was a time where Jesus was being followed by a woman who was looking for a miracle. Problem was she was a Samaritan, which was a half-breed. She was before her season. Jesus hadn't died yet for all of the people of the world. He was in the season of ministry that was only for the Jews. She was asking him to do a miracle for her and Jesus turned and said something very offensive to her. Even had racial undertones. It was very much a hot button at that time. He said, I cannot take, or it's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Speaking of her race as a Samaritan, speaking of her position as a woman in culture, He gave her an opportunity to get offended. She instantly responded to him and said, but Lord, even the dogs eat the scraps that fall from the master's table. Jesus presented her with an opportunity to get offensive over a very hot racial and gender specific issue. And she passed the test and she chose being right with God and being pure in God's sight over offense in her life. And that flipped the switch inside of Jesus. and He released her miracle to her. I believe that God's got a miracle here for someone. You've been in the habit of being offended. You've been in the habit of being triggered. Jesus is giving you the opportunity to escape from that and to step into a new season of life where you're unoffendable. You refuse to be offended because you want the miracle. You want the healing. You want the righteousness. Father, in the name of Jesus, would you have way, 
have your way in the hearts of these beautiful people. Work inside of them in Jesus' name. Do a work in their hearts right now. If, that, if that's you and you resonate with this, with the offense uh, or being stuck in that place or, or potentially with, with not allowing Jesus to be the Lord of certain parts of your life or maybe not at all, if that's you, we're gonna pray a prayer right now. And I wish to, just all across this room that you would pray this with us. Just say this, say, Father, I need your help. I'm opening my life to you. Would you come into my heart? Come into my life. Jesus, I put my faith in you. I make you my Lord, my master. I believe you rose from the dead. I make you last master over my finances, master over my feelings, master over my future, master over my family. You're the Lord of all. Help me with offense. Help me to escape it and to come into a beautiful season of freedom whom the sun sets free is free indeed. In Jesus' name, I am saved. Amen. Come on, lift up your, give the Lord a hand. Give the Lord a hand. Let's, why don't you stand to your feet for just a second. Let's, let's, let's save this glow for a second. Let's worship for just one more minute. Let us know that you prayed that prayer today and you got your life right with God. We want to know. We want to connect with you and help you. Uh, but also in this room, if there's someone in this room, if you prayed that prayer today and you got your life right with God, I want to give you the chance to acknowledge that. And, and this is why. Um, the, Jesus said it like this. He said, if you acknowledge him in front of people, he will acknowledge you in front of the Father in heaven. That's a really, really big deal. So I just want to give you the chance to be acknowledged by Jesus. We're not going to embarrass anybody or do anything weird. I just want to give you the chance just to raise your hand and say, that's me, Joel. I, I, I gave my life to Jesus. I, I prayed that prayer, and I got right with God today. If that's you, would be, you'd just be the boldest person in the room. When I count to three, shoot your arm super fast. Ready? One, two, three, go. Be bold. Anybody? There you go. One, two. There's another one over there. Three. That's it. That's great. 
Anybody else? Anybody else? Raise it up high for me. That's great. That's great. Praise God. Praise God. We'd love to connect with you. You prayed that prayer. You made that decision. Just stop by. Um, right When you walk out the doors, there's a place that says Next Steps. Just stop by there. We'll help you in any way we can. We'll get you a Bible. We'll get you connected. Whatever you need, we want to help and connect uh, with you. Amen. Amen. Well, hey, you can be seated for just one more second. Uh, I want to give you just a great, a quick report. We're going to worship the Lord with our offering, something that we do every single week. None of this is possible without people of faith being incredibly generous, and I'm so grateful for you. Um, we have ministries literally all over the world. The stuff that we're doing right here, you're seeing a lot of our projects that are happening and great ministries that are being launched. Uh, but we've got ministries all over the world. We, we rescue child soldiers uh, over in the Middle East. We have a ministry that does that, that we sponsor every single week. We've got a village in Africa. Uh, We've got ministry stuff going on in Nicaragua. We're literally are launching. We've already mobilized in the first two and a half months of this year. We've already mobilized close to $200,000 into missions, into church planting, missions in Africa, missions in China, missions in Nicaragua, all kinds of stuff, all the projects that are going on, the mission stuff. We've already literally, we've got probably... $350,000, $400,000 $350,000, dollars $400,000 of, of projects that are, that are going to launch all the new things that are happening. Guys, we're doing really big and amazing things. And I, I want to just appreciate you for being generous because without your generosity, we can't do the work of the, of the kingdom. We can't, that, that's what happens when you guys give. It creates the opportunity for us to go in all the world and preach the gospel, doing amazing things. And I, I want to share one more cool opportunity that's coming. Uh, we talked with our, one of our missionary pastors in Nicaragua, and we're planning for either the end of this year or the first of next year, a family mission trip to Nicaragua, where you could go as a family and actually go and do missions work together. I've been to Nicaragua, I don't know, a dozen times, and uh, it's a beautiful part of the world and a great open harvest field for ministry and something we can do. So lots of great, wonderful things. But I just want to thank you for being generous and encourage you, if you haven't stepped up, because it's a faith thing. Giving is a faith thing. It's a faith thing. It's about trust. And, and the way I know that is because the number one thing where people, when they say they don't give, it's, they normally say, well, I don't know what they do with the money. That's a trust issue. It's a trust issue. For me, as a pastor, we have a board. We have all kinds of things. We have a CFO. We have to do all kinds of audits. We do all types of things to make sure that there's nothing funny going on with the money. But when I was, when, before I was a pastor, when I was a person in the church worshiping, when I give, I give to God. If someone does something wrong with that, that's on them. The Lord will discipline them. He'll deal with that. But for me, it's about me honoring and obeying God. And the Bible literally says that when you give here on earth, men receive it. But God receives it in heaven. God actually receives your offering when you give. It's a powerful thing. It's part of our worship. So thank you. You can scan the QR code. Uh, the QR codes are also on that little back. There's a giving box at the back back there. You can go on to our app, Oaks Church uh, McKinney, I believe, in the app store. Um, you can find it at oakschurch.com. However you do it, just thank you for your generosity. It's making a huge difference in impacting uh, missions and ministries all around the world. Amen? Amen. Why don't you stand to your feet? Uh, we're going to make our Oaks Declaration. Listen, don't forget, pick up your little invite cards. Be inviting people like crazy. Do not miss, do not miss uh, Easter next week. It's going to be awesome. Are you ready? Loud and proud, say it with me. Don't leave me up here standing by myself. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to bring good news, comfort the brokenhearted, and proclaim God, freedom for God's people. I am an oak of righteousness planted by God for His glory.